We are lost and undone, strangers in this world, aliens. In this day and time, it's comforting to know we have hope in something far bigger than ourselves, and especially during those times of despair. Remember, where there's life, there's hope. Welcome to Hope Church in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. Thank you for joining us for our live broadcast. Now, let's join the service already in progress. And that you will respond to us. So by faith today, Lord, we thank you. We give you praise that you've heard prayers. We give you praise that you've heard our hearts, that you know what our thoughts are even before we utter the words from our lips. And Lord, like the psalmist David prayed, let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our heart be pleasing, be acceptable to you. Lord, let our minds be stayed upon you. Let our thoughts be focused upon you. And Lord, let us be people who walk in faith and confidence because of who you are acknowledgement of whose we are through Christ. We ask these things in the matchless, mighty, magnificent, powerful name of Jesus. And everybody that believes said, Amen. Amen. You could be seated this morning. Thank you for worshiping the Lord, for praying today, and for acknowledging Him for who he is. Clay, you want to come up here and make a quick announcement? I don't know that... Yeah, okay. Okay. Is, can you hear anything? Okay. That's better. I can hardly talk today, so bear with me. <clears throat> This is an unpaid commercial for the class that's going to start next Sunday out in the Annex at 9.30 sharp on how to read the Bible. This is a repeat of what I did in the, in the spring, in the fall, I mean, and we're going to do it again for the spring. <clears throat> um, so I want those of you who might be interested in this class right now to prepare to write down my phone number when I'm finished here because I need to hear from you if you want to come to the class, okay? Um, week after week, Brother Joe keeps talking to us about reading the Bible. And I guess most of us are just about tired of hearing it. Uh, but the point is, it is important. Um, the class that I'm going to try to teach, with the Lord's help and your participation, is about reading the Bible. Um, some of the things that the class is designed to help you with, number one is all of us, whether we like it or not, have a resistance to doing the things God commands us to do. Part of it is what Paul calls the flesh. It's just us and our desires and our wants and wishes and everything. So we all struggle, first of all, with ourselves about reading the Bible. And secondly, we struggle with the powers of the enemy that we don't even see or know about. The Bible in the New Testament repeats, re, does, says repeatedly that the devil is ready to snatch away from you the word of God, snatch away from you any understanding of what God is trying to say to you. So part of the class will be, okay, so what do you do? How do you deal with this? If you don't want to read the Bible and the enemy is out to keep you from reading the Bible, what are you going to do? We'll talk about it and provide some tips about what to do about resistance to reading the Bible. Another thing we will address is the big picture. Many of you know this verse here and that verse there and this book here and that book there.
but how many know the big picture of the Bible? What is it all about from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22? What is it about? We're going to talk about the big picture, what the Bible is about. And when you read the book of Isaiah, where did that happen in the history of this big book? Most people don't have a clue, okay? So part of the class is about the big picture. Another one is about getting hold of resources to make it easier to read the Bible. Some of you are struggling simply because the language of the Bible you're trying to read is difficult. It doesn't have to be. And finally, we're going to try to help every person have a realistic quote, unquote, realistic reading plan. You need to think about how you're going to do it, and then you need to make it practical. In other words, it's got to work. If you expect to read the Bible an hour tomorrow when you have never read it for the last three months, you're wasting your time. It's got to work. And then the last and final benefit of this group is its input from other people. Don't come thinking you're just going to hear a lecture from me because that's not going to happen. <laughs> We're going to have discussions about all of these things related to reading the Bible. Now, if, if you want to come to the class, as I said before, my phone number is, everybody ready? 918-520-1644. And if I don't answer, and I don't always answer strange phone numbers, so if I don't answer, please leave a message. I'll be happy to get back to you. Again, the number is 918 918- Five two zero one six four four. All right. Everybody get that? So Clay has a gift for teaching, and we want to um, take advantage of the gift that God has placed in him. Uh, many of you know some of his story about what he's done historically. You know, uh, in his ministry, and so we want to we want to take advantage of that. Appreciate his ministry, his willingness to teach this class. Um, so come, be a part. If you went through it last time and you want to do it again, there's there's uh, that's a great idea. In fact, uh, uh, I would just I would just say that you know some of you have probably read the Bible through many times throughout your lifetime. Um, there's always something fresh to gain and something new to uh, to find and appreciate. So. Definitely uh, take advantage of that. Pastor Joel is going to be talking. Uh, I don't know when he's going to start it yet. He hasn't told me. First week of February. All right. Starting in the first week of February on Wednesday nights, he's going to do kind of a Bible survey class. Could be a complimentary thing to what, what Clay is doing as well. Clay's looking at how do, we, how do we attack this book of life that God's given to us, this living, breathing uh, you know, expression of God's Word. How do we do that? And then Pastor Joel is going to be taking a survey approach uh, book by book. Uh, you, did you say you're going to do like a book a week? I'm going to try to do a book a week. Now, that will be a real challenge for him and for the Wednesday night crowd. Uh, but I, I will venture to guess he's going he's gonna to do his best to, uh, to press on in that regard. But this will be at least a year-long uh, effort, I'm sure, and you'll definitely appreciate it. So come and be a part of that on Wednesday nights as well. I know that uh, I know that will be helpful. Jaron, where are you and Ricky at? They're in the nursery. Are they working today? Well, come here. <laughs> I haven't had a chance to tell you guys officially since uh, since they decided to announce their nuptials, but. Uh, Is she hiding? There she is. Hi, Ricky. All right. You guys turn around and look at them. Embarrass them real good. Yeah, there they are. They're getting married in October. Woohoo! <laughs> you know, it'll be uh, church camp before we know it. Uh, church camping season will be upon us. We'll be talking about camp. But uh, uh, those two are, are a product of church camp. 
and in the sense of uh, their, their meeting and where they first got to know one another. We have pictures of them as little kids <laughs> at church camp. And then every year we have additional pictures as they've grown and matured. And uh, uh, they've actually decided to um, have their wedding at Big Cedars at church camp. So uh, that'll be a fun event coming up in October. And uh, anyway, they, they got engaged Thanksgiving weekend. Mr. Romance uh, pulled off a big, uh, a big surprise. And so congratulations, guys. We love you. All right. All right. Now go back and, yeah, do whatever you were doing. Sorry to distract. I will, uh, I will reemphasize again what I said last Sunday. Um, we've installed this week. Jaden and I have spent uh, considerable time up here working. Uh, installing security surveillance system we have uh, several cameras that are recording 24 7 here inside uh, the auditorium the main entrance as well we'll soon be uh, positioning a couple on the exterior of the building uh, of course this all i guess in response uh, to the recent um, shooting in texas have some other things in play that we'll be announcing in the not too distant future letting you know a little more detail uh, to complement the, the surveillance effort, uh, we've, uh, we've begun locking the back door uh, about the time service begins. So if uh, you normally come in there, you'll need to probably make your way um, toward the front entrance because the back one will be locked. Usually 1025 or so, we're, we're turning the key there. So uh, just, just FYI. And, uh, and then we have a lock placed on this door here and at the top of the stairs to protect uh, access to our children's wings. So anyway, just uh, different things, trying to be uh, uh, thoughtful and put a little forethought into preparation in this difficult time that we live in. And Pastor Joel mentioned that before receiving the offering today. We do live in a difficult time, and despite uh, our best efforts, sometimes the enemy still uh, is doing what he can to disrupt God's people and uh, the peace that we enjoy. So just be aware, and uh, thanks for your consideration and participation in, in these efforts. I want to talk this morning, continue a series that I kicked off last week where we talked about uh, lessons from Job. This is going to be probably four or five weeks uh, long. And uh, last week we talked about choosing faith. We talked about the things that will happen whenever you choose faith. Uh, we know that, that we suffer in this life. This life is filled with frustration and difficulty and pain and anguish and death and sorrow. And much of that Jesus came ultimately to resolve in eternity that's yet to come. But until that time that we're in His presence for eternity and wherever heaven is, um, we're going to deal with some of this stuff. And Job helps us to see some of that. And so last week we talked about what happens when you choose faith choosing faith doesn't make the pain stop it doesn't make the suffering end it doesn't make things go away but it helps us in the midst of the circumstance to still have god's peace in our hearts and so we talked about that this week because we see job's friends um, sharing some of their wisdom or what they perceived to be wisdom with him how many of you have ever had someone offer you some unsolicited advice anybody yeah. how many have been the uh the generous uh givers of unsolicited advice along the way yeah there's a lot of people that uh that that give advice and uh we sometimes get advice often that we do not want and uh so this morning i want to talk about what I've called six big questions about advice. So we're going to use some examples from Job's friends. And I'm going to give you some suggestions on giving and receiving advice. So we're going to talk six things today, and I'll, I'll quickly go through these, and then we'll go through each one individually. Questions are, is it biblical? Is it factual? Is it necessary? Does it acknowledge human imperfection? Is it teachable? And does it, is it delivered or spoken in love? It's a story about an angel that showed up at a seminary faculty meeting and the dean of, of the seminary and several of his uh, 
professors had been uh, meeting, and the dean was a very exemplary individual. His uh, behavior was uh, beyond reproach and without question. He was uh, a very kind individual, a very loving individual, and, and God had decided to reward him. <clears throat> And so he sent an angel to this faculty meeting and just, of course, shocked everyone when the angel appeared. And he was given some choices. He was uh, given the choice of limitless wealth, infinite wisdom, and unmatched beauty. And the whole staff was on hand, and the, the dean asked for some advice. And uh, wasn't long, they all kind of came to a consensus that infinite wisdom was the best choice. And so the dean told the angel, he said, well, I guess I want to be the wisest man on earth and the angel said done and poof instantly disappeared so every department head in the room and all the professors that were there sitting around the table began to stare at him in almost perfect silence sitting still wondering waiting i guess uh for this man who now had kind of a faint halo over his head to dispense with some of his brilliance and some of his wisdom and Finally, somebody said, well, and very carefully and slowly and deliberately, he said, should have taken the money. <laughs> Sometimes you get bad advice. There's a warning that people have often understood. In fact, for centuries, people have said, some things need to be taken with a what? Grain of salt. In ancient times, salt was hard to come by. It was expensive, and it was medicinal. In Latin, people were warned that counsel needed to be cum grado salis. In other words, there was some advice that might not be so healthy. And in that light, you wanted to keep some medicine around in case you swallowed the wrong advice. If you live long enough, and I'd say most everybody in this room today has lived long enough, but if you live long enough, you will receive at some point some imperfect advice. And if you're honest enough to admit it, you'll also give some advice that doesn't come at just the right time or just the right thing. Whether you're giving or receiving advice, though, especially as followers of Jesus, I think that Scripture gives us some good examples to follow. And in particular, the book of Job points out some things. Now, if you read these verses, if you read the entire chapter of of, of all the chapters of Job, you'll think that those guys were idiots. You'll read some of the stuff they say and some of Job's responses and understanding they make a whole lot of assumptions. They don't know the story of the conversation between God and Satan. They don't really know Job's heart. But what they do know and the experience that they do have with Job should not suggest some of the assumptions that they make. But yet they have conclusions that they draw and based on those conclusions they feel incredibly free to share a lot of silly stuff. Kind of sounds like today. So here are some things that I think are important for us if we're giving or receiving advice, the very first and most important one, is it biblical? Is it biblical? Now, as a sidebar, I'll just tell you, if you want to discern wise counsel, you have to know Scripture. There are a lot of people in the church that are really, 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 really good at worshiping. There's a couple of generations that have cornered the market on worship. 
people know how to worship. But a lot of people don't know how to read the Bible or to pray. And that's a reality of our culture. And it causes Christians to live way beneath the privilege that I believe God intends for us to. Because we don't know the Word of God, we can't discern the will of God. And when we can't understand the will of God, we think we have to have a special word from God. But yet, we don't read the words He's already given to us. Let me just say this. What you think and how you feel are not skills in biblical discernment. It really doesn't matter how you feel or what you think if it conflicts with Scripture. And that's a really hard thing for many of us to understand. Because we draw conclusions based on aspects of God's character. Well, God's loving, so surely He wouldn't this. Or God's compassionate, and He can't be that way. Or God's merciful, so I know He wouldn't do that. Yes, He is all of those things. That's why you have to know what the Bible says. Not just a verse here or a verse there or an experience through worship or a good sermon or a a nice teaching that someone has shared. You have to know what the Bible says. Hebrews chapter 4 says, The Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and it judges the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Now what you probably aren't thinking of about that passage of Scripture is the process through which bone, marrow, and joints are divided. There's a little bit of science here that the Holy Spirit wants us to think about. How many have ever known someone that had to have a bone marrow sample or a bone marrow transplant, anything like that? Some of you have heard of that. Let me just tell you, that's an incredibly dangerous and tedious procedure. It's also painful. Learning Scripture... And applying it to our lives is not easy. It requires discipline. Discerning the will of God and understanding the wisdom that comes from God requires application consistently. Not just on occasion. A lot of people know how to pray in crisis. 911. Help! That's crisis praying. And that's how a lot of Christians pray, but that's not the way God wants us to pray. Now, that doesn't mean He doesn't respond to us when we pray that way, but He wants us to grow beyond that. How many of you would want your 16-year-old child to still scream like a newborn infant? That's what Christians do in many respects today, is they still scream like they're newborns, but yet God's enabled us through His Word and through the Holy Spirit to grow beyond that. One of Job's friends said, in Job chapter 5, verse 27, he said, we have examined this and it is true. How do you know another man's examinations have turned up truth? Only if you have spent time in the word of truth can you discern good counsel from another person. Personal observation and personal opinions do not necessarily equal foolproof counsel. In fact, if you're connected to the world at all, you understand there are so many competing points of views and opinions in existence today, on every imaginable topic and theme? Only the Bible is trustworthy for perfect counsel in your life. 
And when you can lean on clear biblical teaching, you are leaning on a rock that will not move. Had you been on the British coast in 1845, you might have seen two ships boarded by 138 of some of the finest sailors in England. Their task was to chart the Northwest Passage around the Canadian Arctic to the Pacific Ocean. The captain, Sir John Franklin, hoped this effort would be the turning point in Arctic exploration. History shows that it was not because of its success, but because of its failure. Neither ship ever returned. Every crew member perished. And those who followed in the expedition's path to the North Pole found remains and learned this lesson. Here's the lesson. If you're going to take a trip, you have to prepare for it. Interestingly, if Franklin didn't really prepare, though the voyage was projected to last up to three years, he only carried a supply of food sufficient for 12 days. Similarly, only 12 days supply of coal for the auxiliary steam engines. But what he lacked in fuel and food, he made up for in entertainment. Each of the two ships carried more than 1,200 books, a hand organ, china place settings for the officers, expensive wine goblets, and sterling silver flatware. Kind of makes you wonder if they were planning for a party or an Arctic exploration. A Caribbean cruise, perhaps. But judging from the supplies, one would have to think that it was the latter they were planning for, a cruise more than anything else. They didn't carry any specialized clothing. They wore their stately, noble, respectful uniforms. But they were woefully inadequate for the task of the cold weather and rough seas that they were sure to face. Crews that followed eventually found the ornate silver knives, forks, and spoons near a clump of frozen, cannibalized bodies. It seems really odd how some people so smart and so skilled could embark on such a journey so ill-prepared. But I think the point is, God's Word is our map. And the Holy Spirit is our compass. And if we ignore years of training opportunities, we shouldn't be surprised if disaster strikes us. Someone sharing their opinion, or you sharing your own opinion, apart from biblical truth, is not useful. People will often ask me, do you do counseling? I say, no. I don't. I'll be, a, I'll be a biblical counselor. I'll share scripture with you. But I'm not a therapist. If you want a therapist, I know a good one. If you need someone that understands brain chemistry and neurophysiology and the neural pathways and how all those things work together and what different kinds of encounters that you have in life, dealing with trauma, dealing with loss, dealing with grief, dealing with experiences that cause things to happen in your brain that respond in your body that ultimately can affect your outlook and your perspective and everything that you do, well, then that, that, that may be a therapist. But if you want biblical counsel, I can help you there. But if you're looking for anything beyond that, I'm probably not your guy. Because I'm going to consistently, those of you that have met with me and talked with me in the past will, will have to acknowledge, I'm going to consistently say, well, what does the Bible say? What is true? It really doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what your opinion is. And it surely doesn't matter what you feel. You say, well, all those things are things that God gave me. Yes, He gave you the capacity to think. And then He told you, renew your mind with the Word. A mind that's unrenewed by the Word, the thinking can't be trusted. And feelings that are in conflict with an unrenewed mind 
or in concert, rather, with an unrenewed mind will lead you down a path that the Proverbs says there's a way that seems right, but the end of it's destruction. Why? Because like Clay said earlier, we all have a natural tendency to want to resist the things that God wants us to do. It's just a natural human tendency. And then we have an enemy of our souls whose objective in this world is to destroy your life. And he does it in a very subtle way. He does it even in some kind of what people would say nice way. And don't be judgmental, pastor, because if you're judgmental, then you're not, you know, whatever. Come on, Jesus was judgmental. He called a woman a dog. He was very plain in expressing his opinion about certain things. He didn't tell us to not judge. He told us to not judge harshly. And oh, by the way, he flipped some tables over. He called people names. That wasn't harsh, apparently. Is it biblical? Job's friend Zophar urged him in Job eleven fourteen, put away the sin that's in your hand and allow no evil to dwell in your tent. So is it biblical is the first question. The second question is, is it factual? Like Zophar, Eliphaz shared some counsel with Job in chapter 4, verse 8. He said, those who sow trouble reap it. But what was the problem? The facts didn't support their observation. And what they didn't know is that God had said Job was blameless and upright. If you're going to give advice or receive advice, it should be biblical, it should be factual. The suffering that followed Job was the toughest test of his life. But it wasn't punishment. It wasn't punishment for something he had done. That's what we often conclude. History in the early church, there were disputes that arose between early church leaders. So many non-Jewish people were becoming Christians that there was confusion on what Jewish customs should be observed, what laws were binding and what were non-binding. Eventually, the believers all got together and the leaders held a meeting. We find it in Acts chapter 15. And with great difficulty, men like Peter and Paul and others that were apostles, met in Jerusalem for a council, and there they heard the case and sorted out the facts. And careful attention was given to details of factual information. If the facts aren't correct, the council is not useful. If the facts aren't correct, it doesn't really matter how distinguished the individual is that's sharing them. Careful attention has to be given to factual information. Again, this is why reading and knowing Scripture is important. You may know a verse from Scripture. John 3, 16, God so loved the world, He gave His only Son. Whoever believes in Jesus will be saved. Yeah, it says whoever believes. It also says that the devil and demons believe and tremble. So apparently believing isn't the only criteria for entering into the kingdom of God. But again, we make certain conclusions based on cursory observations and faulty information that lacks factual details. Is it biblical? Is it factual? Here's a good one. Is it necessary? Job chapter 2, verse 13 says, They sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights, and no one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. But then they decided to start talking. You see, you have to ask yourself a question. Did Job really need what they had to offer? He's going through the greatest crisis in his life, and they decide to reprimand him. 
They want to debate with him. Was it really necessary for his wife to add to his troubles by unleashing her own anger? Sometimes grieving together in silence is preferable. Is it necessary? It's wise counsel to use a few words rather than speaking in many. One of the most misunderstood and often misquoted or applied scriptures is found in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It's, it's poorly quoted and even worse in its understanding. Very often people will say, well, you know, God won't put more on you than you can bear. Baloney. Paul even says it. It became so bad we despaired unto death. We wanted to die. No, what it says is no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are, He will provide a way out so that you can bear up under it. What does that mean? That means it's going to be rough. But whenever it's rough, if you choose faith... If you look to God, if you don't run toward the devil or run toward yourself, and you turn your heart toward Him, He'll show you a way to get out. Somehow, this has migrated to the theological world to this other silly idea. And I can't tell you how many times I've heard people share that very unnecessary statement whenever someone is hurting. When people are hurting, they don't need you to tell them, well, God won't give you more than you can bear. Harriet Sarnoff Schiff distilled her pain and tragedy into a book she called The Bereaved Parent. When her young son died from a congenital heart malfunction, a clergyman took her aside and said, I know this is a painful time for you, but I know you'll get through it because God never sends us more than we can bear. He only let this happen because he knows you're strong enough to handle it. Well, because she was obviously smarter than him, she quickly drew a logical conclusion and said, So, if only I were a weaker person, my son would still be living? If you want to be mature in your faith, you will probably learn that your advice is sometimes better left unsaid. Job's friends sat on the ground with him. Very often being present is much more valuable than being heard. Is it biblical? Is it factual? Is it necessary? Is it Teachable. Another way of saying this is, is it worth repeating? (laughs) Is it worth repeating? Eventually, Job would be able to pass along his lessons learned to the generations that followed, but most of the counsel he received from his Friends, wasn't worth repeating. Wasn't teachable. One friend said, should not your piety be your confidence? Job 4, 6. Said in the same passage, and your blameless ways, your hope. He would tried that route. It didn't work. He'd followed the law. He'd followed the things that he knew was right and done what he was supposed to do. And yet, we see in Scripture that this thing still happened. And you know, it's interesting, instead of Job 
passing on what he learned from God in terms of an answer to why it happened. What he passed on was what he learned about God. His personal encounter with the Lord proved to be a turning point in his life and also to his friends and his family. He never got an answer about the question of suffering. You see, if you're going to follow the Lord, you have to resolve that you're going to follow Him, period. Not follow Him if. Following the Lord requires us to be devoted to following the Lord. Not following the Lord based on what He does or doesn't do, but following the Lord based on who He is. Job didn't get an answer to his question of suffering, but what he did gain is an understanding and insight into the nature of who he was. The understanding was very teachable. And we remember today about Job's faith, the fact that he saw who God was. Is it biblical? Is it factual? Is it necessary? Is it teachable? This is a good one. Does it acknowledge... Human deficit. You see, what do you mean by that? How many, whenever you're in a disagreement or a conflict of some sort and you're having a discussion, are generally willing to say, it's highly likely I'm wrong. Or when you're sharing your opinion on social media, how many preface your really cute snarkiness by saying, I may be wrong here, but. You see, wisdom requires us to acknowledge human imperfection. There are some people who are always right. Anybody know those folks? I mean, they are always right. Even when they're not right, they're right. And they are so convinced they will fight you. Sometimes the wisest counsel is acknowledging that you may never know the answer. How many have watched the, pers- or the, the uh, uh, current events this last week? Most of us have. So many experts, countless experts on varieties of news platforms, and then, goodness, I didn't know there were so many Middle Eastern experts that I had in my friends list on Facebook, but buddy, there are some smart people apparently. Middle Eastern experts. And here's what I also know. For probably 1,500 years, this kind of stuff's gone on. And all the experts have never figured it out. But everybody is so right and convinced of their opinion on this kind of stuff. Listen, if it's true wisdom, it has to acknowledge... that the why may not ever be answered. Job's question of why disappeared the moment he encountered God. If you read the story of Job, whenever he finally had his encounter with God, he never, after that, asked God why. That's why I'm convinced that Sometimes in our experience in this world where it's very hard and pain and suffering occurs and we're often consumed by why is this happening and how could God let this happen? And if God's a loving God, if God's a merciful God, if God's really a good God and not an evil God, why would He do this? If we're asking those questions, we haven't had the right encounter with Him. See, there's a lot of people that ask me questions and One of my big answers is, 
There are some things we just don't know and we're never going to. And if you're going to take a position of a hard stance of understanding on certain biblical themes that the Bible doesn't clearly say, you're in pride. You're not in submission to the Lord. It's okay to not know the answer. You'll see as we read and study Job that all the human counsel, the previous 35 chapters, chapters that Job had received, dissolved into meaningless chapter or meaningless chatter the moment that God appeared. The perfect, the perfection of who God was consumed and enveloped and disintegrated the imperfection of the human counsel that had been given. There was a time when the disciples were walking with Jesus and they were joined in a theological debate. They were in Jerusalem, a city that was overflowing with theological discourse on a regular basis because of its proximity to the temple. And they came across a blind man. John chapter 9, verse 1. And their discussion seemed highly intellectual. Their discussion seemed like it would probably be on point. And they said, Lord, Rabbi, who sinned that this man or his, was it it this man or his parents that he should be born blind? Now imagine that. A blind man, within hearing distance, I'm pretty certain, suddenly becomes the point of conversation of an insensitive group of Jesus followers, having an unnecessary discussion about his morality. He's a beggar already. Why don't you just kick him in the head? Societally, he's an outcast. He can't do anything for himself. He's been a beggar his entire life. He sits there day after day after day relying upon someone to help him. And you Jesus followers have an insensitive conversation about his morality. But it's funny how judgmental humans are soon able to discover that what they think they figured out, they really haven't figured out at all. Because Jesus answers, and in a sense he says, "Uh, well, you kind of missed the point here, boys. You're on the wrong track. You're debating something that has nothing to do with this man's physical condition. This happened so God's glory can be revealed. And he healed the man. The glory of God showed up suddenly and surprisingly right there in that place. And nobody ever asked the question again. Is it biblical? Is it factual? Is it necessary? Is it teachable? Is it acknowledging human deficit and imperfection? And lastly, is it spoken in love? See, there's a crisis in the church today, I believe. I've rarely come upon a person who wasn't aware of their sinful condition. Scripture says God writes His laws in the hearts of humanity. We all know. We're all aware. And I've rarely come across people who don't realize that they're sinners. Even if they've never been to church in their life. 
If there's a sincere conversation that takes place, they recognize their lack, their deficit, their defeat. Some of them may not speak the right language. They may not describe it the same way you or I would, but they're aware. Then again, some of them do because they've been preached at by Christians. who had insensitive, judgmental conversations about them that really had nothing to do with their condition. Is it okay to remind us all that sinners sin? Right? That's what sinners do. Sinners sin. And it shouldn't surprise me or shock me or offend me that a sinner sins. No matter how biblical, factual, necessary, or valuable your counsel is, it will never be accepted unless it's shared with an attitude of love. Here's a good one. Bildad. This running dialogue between Job and his friends becomes more and more heated as they struggle to have these discussions. Bildad takes a cheap shot at his kids. Wasn't bad enough that he's sitting there. His clothes are covered in ashes. His body is covered in sores. He's broken pieces of pottery to scrape the wounds. They're like boils on his body. He's in immense pain. Physically, he's grieving the death of his ten children, the loss of all of his wealth and possessions. And this all came about in a matter of a few days. His wife told him to curse God and die. And now this knucklehead, Bildad, says, Well, when your children sinned against God, he gave them over to the penalty of their sin." I don't know that for sure. But as it pertains to the actual context of the dialogue between Job and his friends, Scripture does say that Job offered sacrifices often for his children. And at one point it says that what he feared most had come upon him. So I don't know the spiritual condition of his kids, and that may have had some factual merit. But guess what? It wasn't well received because it certainly lacked love. I told you last week, sometimes we encounter suffering because we're in this world and this place is just messed up and there's suffering. Sometimes we encounter suffering because of stuff we do or don't do. Just like we've heard said, you made your bed, lie in it. Anybody's kids ever steered off the path and got into a mess? Sometimes it's because of choices they made. Sometimes it's because of choices I made or didn't make. And that's exactly what it seems that Bildad is suggesting here. And that may be true. It may be some of the most factual wisdom that was shared. But it wasn't shared the right way. Advice that's given without love 1 Corinthians 13 says, You could be sounding out wonderful truth with the voice of an angel. You could be a powerful spiritual person. You could be a prophet. But if you say it without love, the words are like an irritating, clanging, gonging symbol to the person who hears it. Now, other people may say, wow, that was great. You get them. You tell them the truth. Preach. Yeah, well, if it doesn't apply to you, it's easy to be a cheerleader. But whenever it hits you in the nose, if it's not said in love, it doesn't accomplish what it should accomplish. 
When people are hurting, they long for answers more than ever before. And it's at that point that answers are hardest to come by. And sometimes they don't ever come. But whenever there is an answer offered, it has to be offered with an attitude of humility and love. Terry Anderson was held hostage by Shiite Muslims. He was a former reporter for the Associated Press. He was taken captive and held as a political prisoner for seven years. He was moved from location to location to location, hidden successfully and sentenced to horrible loneliness. Before he was taken hostage, he'd given a lot of thought to matters of faith. And for some reason, in prison, he was allowed to have a Bible. He said, constantly over the years, I found consolation and counsel in the Scriptures, in the Bible that I had been given. He wrote, after his ordeal ended, this is just a test. This world is a test. But comfort from the real, immediate voices of people who've suffered greatly in ways that we often do not understand, even though they may seem close to you, are lacking when what they say is said apart from love. He said, I read the Bible more than 50 times cover to cover during those years I was a prisoner. And the thing that brought me through was the wisdom that was delivered from its pages. He said, what application does that really have? Well, I think it tends to bring it all together. You can share something biblical, but it may not be necessary to share it at the right time. You know, timing's pretty important in this sharing of wisdom. You can share something factual. Maybe Bildad was sharing something factual, but he didn't share it in a loving way. Timing was bad. Experience was difficult i mean what what what's job going to gain from that he's grieving he's broken he's hurting what what's he going to gain from that you see god's word is the preeminent source of wisdom counsel and comfort for this world that we live in if you're seeking counsel from any other means Through worship music, I like worship music. Through southern gospel music, hey, I listen to southern gospel music a lot, believe it or not. Through old hymns or new hymns, redone. Those things will bring you some degree of emotional lift, but it's not going to give you the wisdom and counsel of the truth of the Word of God. Someone else's devotional writings, there's nothing wrong with those. I read some, I appreciate the insight that people have. But that's not the Bible. Video series or teaching of some sort on a particular topic or theme, that's just like gathering in a church service like this. There's something to be gained, something to be received, but that's not the Word. (laughs) We need the Word. And that's what... Mr. Anderson was saying, he was saying, you can't get where you need to go. This world will destroy you. You will die in isolation. You may never be, and I pray you aren't, ever a a prisoner held by Muslim fundamentalists or by anyone else for that matter. But what he's saying is the only real answer that brought me hope or consolation during that deep, dark season of my life was the Bible. Job didn't have the Bible the way you and I have. 
we have the benefit of learning from his experience. You know, this year there's been a lot of cute little sayings been made about it being 2020 and a year of vision and seeing this and seeing that. What's something we say about 2020 often? Hindsight. Hindsight is 2020. You have the benefit of hindsight by looking at Scripture. They were living it in the moment. They didn't have something to refer to. You and I do. We have the Bible, and the Bible has answers for every major circumstance that you will encounter. Does it give you granular detail on whether you should take this job or that job? No, it doesn't, but it tells you how to find the will of God. It tells you how to discern the mind of God. It tells you how to seek counsel and wisdom from Him. It tells you how to be led by the Holy Spirit. It tells you how to pray and seek Him in prayer. It tells you how to, to ask for other people to give you counsel and to walk with you through a challenge. It tells you how to recognize His hand, His, his uh, inspiration, His guidance. <coughs> the Bible, friends. The Bible. That's what we need. And Job's example is recorded there for our benefit. And by hindsight we have the opportunity to see clearly the answers to six really big questions about giving and receiving advice. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for letting us live in the day that we live in. Even though it's not easy, even though there are things that we encounter that are hard, that we don't enjoy or value, I'm grateful that we're living when we're living and where we're living. Father, I pray that our hearts are open to you and to growing in this season. And let me just say, if you're struggling, if you're suffering, if you're going through something and you feel like your life is in turmoil. Don't give up on Him. And be okay with letting Him be God. You may never get the answer to that question, why? And let me just say this. If God answered why every time, we might not always like the answer. But trust Him anyway. Trust Him anyway. I know this about Job. If he hadn't suffered the way he suffered, he never would have had the experience that he had with God. And I'm sure that if you had the opportunity to interview him, and maybe you will someday in eternity, and ask him, he'd probably say the same thing some of us say. Well, I thank God for the experience. I don't want to do it again. But I'm grateful for what he showed me, or I'm grateful for what I learned. We're not signing up to suffer. But in this life, we will encounter pain so, sorrow, sadness, and suffering. Before we go today, I want to ask you this question, and it's just kind of a general theme, but how many would say, I'm committed to growing to where I can give and receive sound biblical wisdom? I'm not just talking about earthly wisdom that comes from having experience in life and being, you know, having so many gray hairs or being however old people think you are when you're wise. I'm talking about whether you're 14 or 114, you have the capacity by the Word of God and by the Holy Spirit to be a person who's wise. How many of us are committed to becoming wise in the ways of the Word of God. Would you? Lots of us? Yeah. That's great. Lots of us. Well, stand with me then.
I know we went a little bit long today. I haven't done that for several weeks. I did that especially for Trish today. <laughs> I want to pray for you. And I want you to walk out of here today encouraged and understanding that, you know what? You're not alone. They write books about struggle. They write books about suffering. In fact, a bunch of it made it into the Bible. And it made it in the Bible to remind you that in the midst of that mess, God is there with you. And He's not going to leave you. Just keep looking for Him. Keep pressing into Him. Keep trusting Him. And He'll bring you through. Father, You see our hearts. You know our lives. You are intimately aware of our struggles, our fears, our frustrations, our pain, our suffering, the mistakes that we've made, the stuff that's happened because of the mistakes we've made, and the stuff that's happened that had nothing whatsoever to do with us. Lord, you are aware of all of it. And today, God, we just remind ourselves once more that it's in your hands. We cast our cares upon you. You are the one who's writing our story. And we're trusting you that no matter what we face, you're going to bring us through. Lord, you see our hands today that were lifted, a commitment to deeper intimacy with you, a greater understanding of your word, to becoming people of wisdom that can share and give, but also receive godly counsel. Lord, I pray that we would be faithful and act upon that pledge today. Go with us now. Guide us by your spirit. Use us for our for your glory and give us opportunities to share your love with others. May it be done in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Amen. God Thanks for being with us today. And remember, our video on demand archives are available to watch at your convenience right here at HopeChurchBA.com. Have a blessed week.